Welcome back to Introduction to Logic. This is Unit 6, Induction and Informal Fallacies. In this brief video, we'll look at fallacies of weak induction, or insufficient evidence. We've already learned that a fallacy is an error in reasoning that undermines the legitimacy of an argument. Formal fallacies are caused by a structural defect in an argument, while Informal fallacies are caused by some defect in the evidence that we're providing for the conclusion. We've also seen that there are countless ways that we could get defective evidence in induction. It might happen because the evidence we're using is irrelevant to the conclusion, like trying to use emotions instead of objective data as support. Beyond having the wrong kind of evidence as premises, we might also fail to have sufficient evidence to allow for a strong inductive inference. Informal fallacies can also occur when we make unwarranted assumptions or because our arguments contain ambiguities that cause the argument to go astray. Now, in our last video, we examined some of the common informal fallacies that occur when we fail to use evidence that is relevant to the conclusion that we're trying to reach. In this video, we'll look at a few examples of informal fallacies that occur when we fail to gather sufficient evidence to warrant our conclusion. We can think of these as fallacies of weak induction, or as I prefer to think of them, fallacies of sufficiency. The key thing to remember with inductive reasoning, whether it's analogical or causal or predictive or statistical, is that we'll never be able to achieve enough evidence to make our conclusion absolutely certain. There's always going to be a gap. Our job is to make sure that the degree of uncertainty in our argument is as minimal as possible. By making the logical gap between the premises and the conclusions as small as we can, we give our arguments greater legitimacy. That's really the best we can hope for. Sifting through the available evidence, finding evidence that is relevant and presenting it clearly, is the hallmark of good induction. And that's also why inductive reasoning is so hard. Take life science as an example. All of us have a general familiarity with biology. After all, we ourselves are biological entities. But when it comes to understanding the mechanisms of biology, how biology actually works, things begin to get a little more difficult. It turns out that biological organisms are incredibly complex, and to understand how they work requires years of study. So when something like a new pathogen comes along, and we all want to understand it, the gap between our knowledge and the knowledge of those who have dedicated their lives to understanding it becomes more apparent. Now reason tells us that if we want to fully understand some new disease, we either have to drop everything we're doing and spend the rest of our lives becoming experts in the field, or, since that's really not feasible, we have to defer to the knowledge of those who are experts. But how do we, non-experts, rationally evaluate the judgment of experts? How do we even know who counts as an expert? It's at this juncture that many of us are actually prone to error. While it's perfectly rational to defer to the expertise of others, we have to make sure that they are a qualified expert. Failure to do so leads us into fallacious reasoning. Just because someone is an expert in some field doesn't mean that they're an expert in every field. So, failing to match the qualifications to the subject in question yields advercundium, appeal to inappropriate authority. Oh, hello, friends. I'm Montgomery Burns, your next governor, and I'm here to talk to you about my little friend here, Blinky. Many of you consider him to be a hideous genetic mutation. Well, nothing could be further from the truth. But don't take my word for it. Let's ask an actor portraying Charles Darwin what he thinks. Hello, Mr. Burns. Oh, hello, Charles. Uh, be a good fellow and tell our viewers about your theory of natural selection. Now, in this silly example, Mr. Burns points us to an expert who supports his position that Blinky, the three-eyed fish, is actually not a problem at all. But the supposed expert is really just an actor, not someone qualified in evolutionary biology, making his so-called testimony 
an unqualified opinion. And since we're only interested in the informed opinions of experts in the field, this shouldn't count as evidence for anything at all. Of course, the problem of appealing to authority is even more problematic than just learning to listen to experts. Experts in a field can, and often do, disagree. After all, the scientific process proceeds using a common method, which is really just an application of induction, and since induction can only yield probable conclusions, scientific knowledge can never reach the level of certainty. We can't really prove anything or demonstrate anything in science. We just move closer and closer to the truth. So disagreement is an essential component of scientific advancement. So what do we, the non-experts, do when even the experts disagree? Well, reason can guide us here as well. After we've established who counts as an expert, we then want to know if there's a consensus among the experts in the field. If so, we have a greater probability of getting closer to the truth by listening to the majority of experts. If there's no consensus at all amongst the experts, reason would demand that we should remain neutral on the question. We shouldn't take sides at all. After all, we are not qualified. So appropriate authority can be good evidence in induction. We just want to avoid ad vericundium, that is, appealing to unqualified authorities or inappropriate authorities. Induction requires us to not only get the right kind of evidence, it also requires us to get a sufficient amount of evidence to make rational inferences. And this brings us to our next informal fallacy of weak induction, the appeal to ignorance. Ad ignorantium occurs when we take a lack of evidence for or against a proposition as evidence for its truth. A lack of evidence can't be justification for holding any belief. In the absence of evidence, we should always remain skeptical. Perhaps the most common mistake we make in inductive reasoning is jumping to conclusions. It's probably the case that humans are hardwired to look for patterns in the world around us. Recognizing patterns not only greatly enhances our ability to survive in the world, it also helps us make sense of what might otherwise seem like a chaotic universe. And you can imagine in a pre-rational world, it was probably better for our ancestors to err on the side of caution and accept apparent patterns, even when there was no real connection between the observed events. In that pre-rational, pre-agricultural world, humans were still part of the food chain, which made survival even more difficult. I mean, imagine that you not only had to worry about getting to work on time in the morning, but you also had to avoid being eaten when you stopped at the drive through to get your cup of coffee. In such a world, it might make sense to have an overabundance of patterns based on as few experiences as possible. But when we move into the logical worldview, when we begin trying to understand what is actually true, not just what's useful for survival, we find that many of our generalizations about the world are unwarranted. You could never trust a woman. You made a hasty generalization, Robin. It's a bad habit to get into. Batman's right. Drawing conclusions about a whole class from only one example, or even just a few examples, is never a good habit to be in. Avoid hasty generalizations. Closely related to hasty generalization is the false cause fallacy. It's not really a single fallacy at all, but rather a host of related weak inductive inferences, including the post hoc and oversimplification fallacies, which are just two really common examples of faulty causal thinking. Identifying cause and effect is the heart of the scientific enterprise, whether it's in the natural or in the social sciences. 
But just because two events are correlated in time, that is, because they happen together or one shortly after the other, doesn't necessarily mean that the first is the cause of the second. That's what post hoc ergo propter hoc actually means. Post hoc, after this, ergo, therefore, propter hoc, because of this. Identifying actual causal relationships is extremely difficult, and if the philosopher David Hume is right, it may actually be impossible. But of course, that doesn't stop us from trying. Ah, not a bear in sight. The bear patrol must be working like a charm. That's specious reasoning, Dad. Thank you, honey. By your logic, I could claim that this rock keeps tigers away. Oh, how does it work? It doesn't work. Uh-huh. It's just a stupid rock. Uh-huh. But I don't see any tigers around here, do you? Lisa, I want to buy your rock. Another common example of fallacies of weak induction that I'd like to introduce to you in this very short video is the slippery slope fallacy. Slippery slope occurs when you make a prediction about the future, always negative, based on no evidence. Of course, Predictive arguments are a common form of inductive reasoning, where we make a prediction about some future event based on our observations of past events. But this form of reasoning goes astray when we try to make a prediction without sufficient justification. This fallacy, the slippery slope, is also sometimes called the camel's nose, and says, don't let the camel put its nose in the tent, because if you do, the rest of the camel is sure to follow. A key element of this fallacy is the negative nature of the predicted outcome. The fallacious inference is actually backwards here, because it's the fact that we agree that the outcome would be negative that causes us to want to avoid the outcome. It amounts to little more than saying bad things are bad and you wouldn't want that to happen. But that gives us no evidence that what was being asserted as the cause of the negative outcome is the cause of that bad outcome. A storm is gathering. A storm of robosexual marriage that will rain down on us like fire. It's probably a firestorm. If robosexual marriage becomes legal, imagine the horrible things that will happen to our children. Then imagine we said those things, since we couldn't think of any. As a mother, those things worry me. Vote no on infinity. Paid for by the Farnsworth Foundation. There is, of course, nothing wrong with making predictions about the future. But the reliability of the prediction is always directly related to the amount of evidence we have for making the prediction. Slippery slope occurs when we make predictions about negative future outcomes based on insufficient evidence. The final example of weak induction I want to introduce in this short video and remember, there are many, many, many more. These are just a few of the most common examples. Is weak analogy. Analogical arguments are one of the most common forms of inductive reasoning we use on a regular basis. Analogical reasoning works by drawing a comparison between two different things or events, and then concluding something that we don't know about one of the cases based on what we do know about the other. Suppose my friend Amy goes out and buys a new car from Chapman Chevrolet. She purchases a red, two-door, five-speed Chevy, and it turns out that she's getting 50 miles to the gallon in her new car. Now, when she tells me about this, I begin to feel a little bit guilty about the Hummer I drive, which only gets four miles to the gallon. So I decide to go and trade in my car and get a new one. So I go to Chapman Chevrolet, and I buy a red, two-door, five-speed Chevy. Am I justified in expecting that I should get similar gas mileage? Not necessarily. When drawing a conclusion based on analogy, we have to keep in mind three main questions. First, how many similarities are there between the two cases? Second, are the analogs, that is, the things being compared, relevant to the conclusion that I'm trying to draw? And third, are there important dissimilarities that I've ignored in comparing the two cases? <laughs>
The closer the analogy, the stronger the conclusion of the argument. The weaker the analogy, the weaker the conclusion. Of course, we can compare any two things and find some similarities. After all, even contradictory propositions are still propositions, so they have something in common. What makes an analogical argument work is having a large set of relevant similarities between the cases. Having now examined some of the more common fallacies of relevance and sufficiency, in our final video in this series, we're going to turn our attention to some common fallacies of presumption and ambiguity. So be sure to join me next time as we continue to learn a little bit of logic. See you next time.